Hey everybody, it's Eric from foundersbeta.com. We're back with another episode on Founder Spotlight. And today we're chatting with the founder and CEO of Mapdain, Hongwei. Thanks so much for joining. Hey Eric, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so we're delighted to hear about the, the story about Mapdain. Of course, one of the fastest growing companies in Waterloo and love to hear more about, uh, you know, a little bit about what Mapdain does. Of course, you know, uh, we heard a lot about it, you know, about, uh, uh, providing platforms for, uh, you know, uh, map, mapping indoors. So, uh, yeah. Oh, well, um, I, I guess maybe we should start at the beginning. So yeah. mapped in, has, you know, we're, we're growing pretty fast right now, but we've also been around for a while. We started out as a school project in, at the University of Waterloo more than 10 years ago, uh, where we wanted to help people find stuff on campus. Um, I think we called it Google Maps of the indoors. And back then you could just say that it wasn't a trademark infringement. Sure. Um, right. and, and, uh, and, and we built that over two years, I think, of just being part time at school and working on this on the side until we eventually ran into our first customer, the local shopping center, and then our second customer, the university itself, and then number three and number four. And that's when it started to get real. Right. So, so how did the idea come about? Like, was it something like, uh, you know, uh, of course, you know, as a school project, was it something like you had the idea, uh, you know, maybe navigating indoors was something you're like, you know, this is something we could do or what was it like? Well, I, I think the, the original, there's two ideas here. One's kind of obvious. One's not that obvious. So the, the obvious idea to us, and it turns out to a lot of other students, we weren't the first school team at Velocity to work on indoor mapping. The, the obvious idea is an app, right? Let's build right. an application that helps people navigate the indoors. Um, and again, that's, that's fairly intuitive. The, the, the non-obvious idea that we discovered after we made those apps was mapping tools. Right. We realized that whether it's a school, a mall, a hospital, a casino, it doesn't matter. Every single building has this problem where you have this built building but you don't have a digital copy. Today, we call that a digital twin. We call that, you know, uh, prop tech. But back then it was just maps. You had office managers, facility managers, marketing coordinators who would go around printing out the original blueprint that's 10 years old and then scribbling out what's wrong, scribbling in what's right, scribbling in what they want to do next, taking a photo of that or scanning it and then sending it to an app maker like mapped in in the early days to say, right. hey, this is what actually is now in our mall. Can you, Photoshop, can you make that look good? And we would Photoshop it and we would put it on their website or put it into their directory. Um, and we realized that if we could somehow build tools for those people, the paper scribblers, um, that would be a scalable uh, solution. That would be a scalable product because every single building manager might want to use that. And so that's, I think, when we really had an idea uh, right. that we could take and scale. <laughs> right. Because I know, you know, founders, your ideas always change from the beginning, right? Because you go in the market and kind of see. Uh, what was it like building like the first version of like the, the product like, you know, uh, you had? Like, um, was it, uh, did it take many months or, or what was it like? What was that first MVP, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, um, very rough. So I guess the first MVP, we would have to consider the, the, the app, the app days. Um, right. So... Luckily, we didn't have as much pressure as some founders put on themselves today. Like we were in school, we were working co-op terms. Right, so like this right, was right. a side project. But when we finally met the general manager of Conestoga Mall, uh, Sandra Stone, who said, hey, I, I get it. This is a good enough demo. I'm ready to buy. Um, and I want it in two months. Can you deliver? Because it, you know, it was September then. She wanted it by Christmas. So realistically, we had to get it installed before Black Friday to make sure everything worked. That's when it got pretty real. Um, Right. And the hardest part about that initial implementation, again, because we already had <clears throat> the mapping tools, the first iteration that I built in C-sharp, we already had the front end, which was the, the, the digital directory interface, right. um, long out of date now. The hard part was getting the hardware, getting the actual directory unit, right. which we haven't done for years, but back then um, it, it had to be all in one. So right. I, I remember having to wire uh, pretty much all the money in my bank account, like $10,000 at the time as a first, second year student right, um, right. to a company in California called Horizon Digital Displays. They happened to have two units on stock on that they were making for somebody else. <clears throat> so wired them the money. They actually did send the units, which is amazing. Right, um, and then we picked it up in like a discount rental truck 
uh, and and had to somehow carry these half a ton units into into the mall. So that was the the hardest part about the MVP was actually the hardware, um, and and I'm so glad we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> right, right. So, so, so uh, talk, uh, talk about like uh, what happened after like, you know, you had like that first, uh, you know, paying customer, which is massive, by the way, uh, which I think that itself is like, you know, for many startups, it's hard to even get there. Right. So, um, sure. so, so what was it after you're like, is this something like, could be, you know, we should just jump at it or full time or should, like, what, what was your thought process? Right. Cause you know, for most founders, it's hard to know when you should actually you know, go full yeah. time on it. Cause I mean, in the beginning, it's hard to, you know, work on an idea, right? <laughs> for sure. I mean, and, and for me, it always felt a little bit more real working on mapped in than whatever alternatives. Um, I think the hardest gate in the road was when I had an internship, a co-op job at Apple mm -hmm. uh, and, and an unpaid four months at mapped in. And I, I chose the latter, of course, but that, that was a hard right. one. Um, <clears throat> cause both, both of those were, were real. You could work on stuff and make money. Um, but it, it like what we did was a slow boil, um, you know, work on it on the side, get our first customer. Okay. Let's take four months off. And then we got our second customer, hired our first employee, our uh, co-op student. And, and I was the least bad at talking to people. So I became the CEO, um, which at the time I didn't realize would also come with like most of the responsibility, right? You got right, customers, right. now you had an, uh, an employee, soon we would have our first investor. Um, at that point I was committed and, right. and we, we, we should have been, we had to be um, to, right. to, if not, if for nothing else to deliver on the obligations to these people. Um, so I think that that's when I took a, a full year off and then the full year became forever. So right, slow boil. Right. Right, and right. I would recommend that to most students if they're listening is you don't have to jump in with both feet, test the waters and, and just make sure what you're building is stuff that people actually want. Right, right. I think that's such a key with validation, right? Any advice you have in terms of like just validating, the, validating that, uh, you know, first MVP, do you get in front of customers or any, any tips you may have? Yeah, always. Um, it, it's so tempting to wait, right? Uh, there's an old adage, like if you're not embarrassed by your MVP, you've shipped too late. Right. Um, so you should, and, and the problem, uh, a common problem that I see and my bias is coming from the engineering and let's say product side right, of things. Right, like most right. of my friends went to engineering school. Um, uh, the, 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 the common mistake is to think that if you build it well enough, people will just show up. Right. Um, and especially in B2B, that's just not the case. Like if you make an app, maybe you can get away with SEO marketing and you just get really lucky with virality. Um, but if you're trying to sell B2B, like if you're trying to sell stuff to a business, you have to sell it. Um, and, and then you have to put it in front of the business and then they're going to tell you what they actually want, which is probably different than what you think they wanted. Um, and, and the most common mistake, and, and it gets made over and over is, well, I'm just going to work on it a little bit more before I put it in front of them because right. I don't want to, I don't want to have my baby get rejected. Um, and I think actually the, the best way to go about it is build a, like a, build a demo, build a mock-up, build something in Figma. And then take that and show it to them and say, look, I can build this, but first I want to know if you'll pay for it. Um, right. And, and uh, I don't know why more people don't do that, but I, I can kind of sympathize with it. You know, that's the thing I'm not good at the talking right. part. I'm good at the building part. So why don't I lean on the building part? And I think it's the opposite. <clears throat> right. Right. Cause I think sometimes as founders, we get too attached, right. Uh, the, to the, to the idea, right. We just want to keep building without talking to anyone. Right. So. Yeah. Is, is it attachment or is it uh, procrastination, which I think we're all guilty of to some extent, right. right, like, right, right. Building's the comfort part. Building's fun. If you like right. building, right. Um, selling is really not fun, especially when your thing is not as good as you know, it can be, but right. it's essential. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so talk about the, the next phase, like, you know, you, you got the first, uh, you know, set a few customers rolling in. What was it after? Like, I mean, uh, was it the time you, you thought, uh, like, like when was the time you, you start thinking about raising money or any, any tips, uh, there? Yeah. I don't feel like I've ever been good at fundraising. I've been good at banging my head against the wall until it kind of works out. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I never, I think there's people who are really, really good at fundraising. Right, um, right. I, I would say the next phase for us was, was a bit, you know, just kind of what every other company does. We, we get more customers, we hire more people, we raise some investment, we spent 
the early rounds poorly, and now we're a lot smarter about how we allocate right. capital. Right. Um, but it, it was, I, I think the thing that we always got right was, was the focus on the customer, right? right. More, than, more than anything else, like, and, and there's some companies, there's some models today, like I, I talk to more and more life sciences companies where you can't really like get customers until you raise $10 million, develop the product, pass FDA approval, as far as I know, I mean, that's what I'm told. I, I don't, I don't know any better to challenge that, but I think the general sense, uh, back then, if you're doing B2B SaaS software without a lot of regulation is like right. as fast as possible, get customers and just build, build your product, get more customers. Um, and I think, you know, we were distracted like everybody else by, uh, fundraising, by vanity metrics, by how many people do you have? But I, I'm, I'm happy to say that we got the customers part right. And, and they're the ones who have really just been there with us the whole time. And we, we almost never lose customers once we get them. So it, right. it's really nice to have that base every year that you're building up. Right. Uh, that's incredible. So what were some of the things that you focused on early on with the customer? Like, did you have many touch points with them? Like, like did you onboard them manually? Like, like what, what was that experience like? Um, well, I mean, early, early on, it was whoever would take our call, <laughs> you know, like I, I sometimes bring up the all hand slides from like 2013, which was the first year we would even do all hand slides. And I would show it to our new hires right, and right. say like in 2013, we had like four leads. Um, right. and that was really exciting because we were going from one customer to four leads right, right now. We get four leads a week. You know, we get, we get a customer almost every day. Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's such a, uh, it's so cool to see like an entire year compressed into a week these days. Right. Um, so back then it was just, look, like we want to map all of the indoors, any building will do. We're still mostly making apps. We hadn't fully committed to the, the insight right. that it was about mapping tools. Mm -hmm. And even if we did, I don't think the world was ready for mapping tools back then. Most people right, still right. wanted the app. So, right. so it, it was, you know, it was just whichever building, uh, whichever customer was most interested. Um, but once we really got into our stride, uh, I would say is once, you know, today we have about 25% of the malls in the world, um, as our Incredible. customers. Um, Incredible. so, so we're the largest and most of them will take our call now, but earning that tranche of market share was just a lot of, a lot of travel. Um, I think I spent in 2017 and 2018, I, I probably spent as much time outside of Canada as I did in Canada. Um, mostly flying coach and like staying in holiday ends around the world or equivalents. Um, but you know, like now we have most of the malls in Australia and the Philippines and, you know, in the UK, right. um, and a lot in places like really cool places that I got to visit, uh, mostly working, but, um, that was just a lot of, a lot of just work. Uh, but it was nice to have our North American customer base as our reference, right? Like right. once we won Canada and the U S everybody else wanted to at least know what they were doing. Um, so it was just execution. And, and again, the, the mall business was still mostly about apps, right? Every mall wanted wayfinding on their screens, on their websites, on their phones. Um, but we had already had the, the bet internally that in the long term it was about tools and the mall biz was just a way to, um, to, to dog food, those own tools, like we're going to use those tools. We're going to give it to this one segment, knowing that in the long term, all the other segments outside of retail are going to want this too. Um, but, but, uh, very happy we did it because that's a, it's a, it's a big part of our business. It's very profitable and it pays for a lot of the R and D investments we make now. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, talk about the, like, you know, uh, focusing on customers, you know, of course, in the early days, you, you know, you've been so customer centric, which I love. Right. And, um, uh, what was it like, like, you know, figuring out like pricing, uh, like, what was it like, was it straightforward for what you were doing or like, did you look at different models? Any tips there? Well, <laughs> the, the original price for Conestoga mall right. was the largest number I could make up on the spot. Oh um, my goodness. And, right. and, uh, and that's like the lowest price we've charged to date. Oh, really? right, <laughs> so we're right. one of the, one of the lowest, especially if you factor in hardware. So, right. um, I, I, I think, you know, we, we, sometimes you go too high and the customer says no and right. you say, okay, well, what's it going to take? And, but most of the time, I think we're pricing for a long-term relationship right. and a long-term right. deployment. Um, we, we have this expression at mapped in land and expand. So, right. um, once, you know, our goal is to get in 
to power, let's say, the web map or, or one use case, betting on the fact that in the long term, they're going to realize once we have this digital map, we should use it everywhere. We should use it not just for the website, but also right. for our apps, also for our directories, maybe for our leasing plans, maybe for our security plans. Um, oh, and the insurance company wants a copy and Apple Maps wants a copy. Uh, so so we we bet on ourselves to to grow the business of every single customer that we win. So we're not actually that fussed about, you know, like optimizing for price on right. the first installation. Um, and, and that's part of our competitive advantage, I would say, is that, you know, we can go to a customer and say, well, look, the reason why you should pick mapped in is not just because we're good at this one thing you're right. looking at now, right. but because we have all these other things that we do. And it's informed by all the customers we have in the world, which, by the way, we have the largest uh, amount of indoor mapping customers out of anybody in the world. Um, and all of those people are paying incrementally in license fees towards our R&D, which you benefit from. Um, right. So I, I recently spoke to a VC who said something very provocative, which was raise prices until you lose customers. And, oh, no, and I have right. to say that is incredibly provocative and I'm not sure we'll ever um, right. get there, uh, but it is an inflationary environment right now. And, and right, we've right. yet to pass those costs onto our customers. So that's right, probably right. something we'll have to do soon. Right, right. It's always challenging, right? I mean, like, especially with everything that is going on, try to figure out, right? So um yeah so let's shift gears talk about uh, people and culture my sure. favorite topic right <laughs> so um, <laughs> me too right so um so tell us a little bit about you know uh the culture at mapped in and, and your team size and and uh, anything that our audience can learn more um so we're about 80 people right now uh we're growing pretty fast this year because over covid uh we had some headwinds right like covid shut down all of the indoors we got pretty freaked out, so we just stopped hiring for a while. Turns out our customers actually did pay on time, and, and we almost turned nothing. So now we're making up for lost time. Um, probably the, the biggest thing I'd say about our culture, like we, we have values that we write down that we try to live up to, and I think most companies do. So I, right. I probably won't advance, like kind of spew the Kool-Aid there too much. Um, but I think the most important additional one to me is that managers do the work at Mapton. Um, right. you know, I, you can't delegate or assign work to anybody that you haven't done yourself and wouldn't do again. Um, and eventually that maybe doesn't scale so well anymore, but right, right now it's working pretty good. And, you know, our, our CTO writes code. I still, I still sell. Uh, recently we launched our public safety product and right. that was like building a new startup within the startup and right, you know, do, right, do right. a little bit of everything. Right. Um, and, and I think it builds a lot of, builds a lot of trust, builds a lot of respect. But also I think it makes managers better because right. how can you possibly know what it's like to hold a salesperson to account and why we're right. not making the quarter if you haven't done it. And, and right. if you, if right. you don't actually know how to like interpret like, well, this, right. this is the reason or here, here's a customer who's saying X. So um, I, I don't, I don't know if that's too unique in the world. It seems to be uh, from some of the feedback we get um, the most common thing I hear from new hires after their three month probation is people here are really nice. Like people actually really want to help me. And right. most people answer my questions as soon as I ask, but, yeah, that, well, that's good to know, but right, right. how the heck are other people getting that wrong? That seems like the easy stuff. Right. right. Um, but it, but it's nice to, it's really nice to have a team that I think plays well together. Um, everyone knows what the long-term goal is. We're, we're, and, and, and as much as possible, we try to relay the, the, the feedback and the wants and, and kind of the, the direction that our customers are moving in and why right. we're focused on that. So um, th that makes it all quite exciting. I think a lot, a lot of us on the team are quite excited about the public safety push we're doing because of all the customers you could want, firefighters are pretty cool customers to have. And, right, and it's it very is. motivating to, uh, right. to be able to help them because um, right. their jobs are, are nuts compared to ours. Right, for sure. Um, so talk about your new hires. Like, uh, what do you look for in your new hires? I, so I have the, the, the privilege of being the last interviewer these days. Okay, so that's good. <laughs> I, I always tell people like, look, if we're talking, like I assume you pass the hard stuff. So like okay. we, have a, we have a fairly rigorous uh, interview process. Mm -hmm. The team goes through a lot of like, you know, the standard like, fit stuff, to, you know, can the manager work with the, the potential right. recruit and, and like a pretty exhaustive technical uh, interview process. If you're in the engineering org, 
Um, and then we have a who interview process, which really gets into like, you know, how do you work best and, and right. trying to, trying to suss out, um, you know, it, it, like we're not a good fit for everybody and vice versa. So right, really right, trying exactly. to get that, get that worked out. I, I think by the time I, I chat with people, I mostly want to know how they learn. Um, are, are they, you know, at the, the best people we've hired at mapped in are low experience, high potential people. Right. Um, partly because I think anyone who's high experience, high potential, well, you know, you're probably not going to come and work at mapped in, um, we're hiring, we're finally getting into the range where we can hire those people, but like, that's like one or two people. And I'm making that hire personally. Um, but if you're truly high experience, high potential, like there's probably, you know, mega scale, like you're joining the, the most recent company that raised a billion dollars or, or you're joining, you know, a mega tech company. Um, so I, th I think the best way that we can hire, that the best people that we can find are the low experience, high potential people. And, and I get really excited about, you know, um, about bringing them on and then nudging them towards, Hey, I think you could do more, you know, look right. at, look at what you just did over there. Like, right. that's really exciting. You, you didn't know how to do that. Let's, let's try something new. Or do you want to come work with me on this project? And like, right. that could be really hard, but if you get that figured out, then, then we all win. Um, and, and, uh, those are some of the funnest, like kind of people and culture stories we have at Mapton. Right. Um, any particular roles that, you know, long-term you like, or, or short-term even you may be hiring for, would it be more engineers? Would it be more product or any particular roles? Yeah. We've always got some roles posted on our, our site. Um, off the top of my head, it's an engineering role, a senior product manager, um, probably another front end role. And I think we have a backlog of, of engineering team leads. So uh, I just would encourage anybody to check out our careers page. There's a lot there. Um, and we'd love to talk to you because we're, there's a lot for us to be working on right now. Right. That's great. So uh, uh, let's talk about the future, you know, um, any, any product updates that you may have coming up or any new markets? I mean, uh, you mentioned a few things, but um, our audience would love to know more. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking before this call uh, in anticipation of this, this one, there's right. some stuff I can't talk about, but we'll course, be announcing real soon. Right, right, right. Um, okay. I, I think the, the, the generally the most exciting thing that Mapton's getting into is, is what we call the platform. So um, I've been talking about apps versus tools and, right. and the insight that, that actually it's about making mapping tools that allow all the paper scribblers inside buildings to maintain their own digital map, which right. is then uh, a kind of a, a foundational layer to all the apps that you want to build on top, whether it's wayfinding by mapped in or leasing or like other prop tech applications, IOT applications. Um, there was this really cool partner that we met recently and it's so out of left field, but it's a good story where, uh, they were building gunshot detection systems. Uh, it was also funded by us FedGov, and they have these like, you know, uh, microphone arrays inside big stadiums. And, it's, and they can pinpoint the, the source of a gunshot. Um, right. and, and, but the founder was telling me they've been doing this for eight years. And since the first demo, uh, most of the time they show their demo of their really fancy hardware tech. And then the customer goes, Hey, like, show me this map view of this PDF map that you're showing me this dot on. Like, how do I zoom in on that? What can I see? What's the context? How do I access that spot? Um, so, so like the map is a, critical part of the user experience for all of these other applications that exist indoors. And, and as we know better than most people maintaining, creating and maintaining that digital map and keeping it up to date is really hard. The indoors right, is right. all private. It changes all the time. Like a stadium will have five different layouts every week. Um, if it's a really busy public stadium. So, um, finally, I think the rest of the, you know, the ecosystem around mapping tools is starting to exist. There's that gunshot detection system. There's desk booking systems, there's leasing systems, security platforms. Um, and we don't want to build all of those apps. We, we would be terrible at it, but we certainly want to power them with better mapping tools. Um, so I think the most exciting thing for us is something we've already been experiencing these past two years, really, uh, which is, you know, people coming to us saying, we just, you know, we're, we're really excited about what we're seeing in your mapping tools and we want to integrate you. So we're the white labeled uh, mapping platform now, indoor mapping platform behind some really big tech platforms already. Uh, and, that, and that's just further accelerating our mission to, to have one map everywhere, one digital copy of every physical building. Um, so I think some of the partnerships and products and features, it's all in that direction. Uh, and, and I think in the next month, we'll be announcing another pretty big 
uh, move that we're making there. Amazing. We'll be on the lookout for that one for sure. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. So uh, talk about the, you know, what, what's one piece of advice? I always ask founders when they come on yeah. board, what's one piece of advice that you, you uh, always been with you, you know, since the early days, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's just, you know, uh, anything really. Yeah. Yeah. I, so the early days, like we never went to YC, um, right. but I read most of what Paul Graham had written. Um, right. and, and I think that's, that's kind of, if you want advice, just go read his essays. Uh, but I think two, one or two that really jumped out at me, like he, he would, there was one where he basically said, you know, when someone comes to YC, goes to YC, uh, they just say, look, all you have to do is focus on product and customers. Please just do those two things, ignore everything else. And, and then the, the, you know, they would say, and, and then they would do everything except those two things. Like that was the hardest advice to take, right? right? Because um, if you look around and you read, you see your friend's Facebook posts, you see other people's Instagram, you, you track what other people are doing. Everyone's raising money. They're right. hiring, they're going to conferences, right. they're winning Forbes 30 under 30 uh, right. for their specific niche category. Right. Uh, and, you know, and, and it's like, oh man, like maybe I should be doing some of those things and, and getting the validation from that. Um, and, and of course, like there are like, that's all good marketing. You should right, probably right. do those things and maybe you do right. need to raise the money, but those aren't like the fundamental of what is going to make a company successful is customers and product. Um, right. and, and so I think that's kind of the North star always has been, um, and, and it's just really hard to take. I, I think the other one that, um, uh, really resonated with me and still does to some extent is, is do things that don't scale. Uh, another PG right. uh, favorite right, quote. Right. And, and the insight behind that is, I think, you know, it's not like you should actually just do things that don't scale forever, because then you'll never scale. But you should, when you're starting a company, if you're only looking for scalable, highly profitable, intuitive ideas while sitting on your couch, right. you're not going to find any. And right, anything right, that right. you found is probably not going to work because why hasn't that been done? Right. Like surely there's companies like mapped in and even way bigger companies like Google that are constantly looking for these scalable, highly profitable right. and like intuitive ideas that are just like hard for technical reasons. Right, right. right. So, so the way to actually find the good remaining ideas that are actually scalable is to start out by doing stuff that doesn't scale that right, people right. still want. And in our case, it was making mapping apps for right. buildings, which allowed us to discover that it was about mapping tools. But if we hadn't made the apps, we never would have found out about the tools. Wow. Um, and I wonder how many more insights are there out there like that, where, you know, like it, you have to go start out and solve a problem, product and customers. And then, right. and chances are the only remaining uh, problems that are worth solving uh, are ones that don't seem to scale. And maybe that's okay, is I think that the real takeaway from that piece of advice. Wow, that's, that's great to know. Well, uh, Hongwei, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. And for our audience that want to learn more, what is the best way? Uh, uh, Follow us on LinkedIn for business news. Follow us on Instagram for people news. And it, you know, we're, we're pretty easy people to find. So reach out anytime. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time. And I'm looking forward to uh, the development we mapped in and your upcoming announcement. So we're super excited. And uh, thanks again for the chat today. Thank you, Eric. Talk to you soon, I'm sure. Awesome.